Hello and welcome to this year's talk at BSD CAN 2022. My name is Warner Losh and I will be talking to you today about upstreaming BSD user to QMU project. The goal for this talk is to provide an architectural overview with an emphasis on the parts I've been working on, on US user emulation, BSD user. I'm going to describe what this program is and how it's used in the project today. I'll also go over how native and uh, processes work and how BSD users differs from that. I'm hoping to generate some interest from people that are want to uh, help me with the upstreaming process. And I'm also going to talk a little bit along the way about uh, different code details that will uh, make the code more approachable. Now, how do you pronounce QMU? Well, QMU, <laughs> or QEMU, or QEMU um, are the answers that I've uh, seen or heard in, in different talks on QEMU. Today, I'm going to just use QEMU as the uh, way to pronounce it. So what is QEMU? Well, QEMU is an emulator that operates in three different modes. The first mode is a full system emulator. This is where it will emulate the hardware of a particular machine in every detail, such that uh, guest OS have no idea that they're even in an em emulator. Also, it acts as a virtualization environment, much like Beehive or Zen. Finally, the part I'm uh, going to talk most about today is the user mode emulator. So, the QMU, sy the QMU system, what is it? Well, it allows you to run any OS on any OS, basically. That's the premise. Here's a screenshot I grabbed from the QMU website, and it shows uh, Windows 7 running on React OS many, many years ago. If you if you have good eyes and can see the screenshots from 2005. But what are the building blocks of the QMU system? Well, there's a CPU emulator called TCG that has a just-in-time compiler and a soft MMU. Uh, in system mode, it talks to an I.O. interface, um, which interacts with the peripheral and memory model. Uh, and the flow control module that you see here uh, deals with things like uh, interrupts and traps and illegal instructions and those sorts of things. When it needs to interact with the host OS, it does through, so through the host kernel. Guests need not have any knowledge of that they're running in QMU, but if they know about para-virtualized devices, they can make use of that. Para-virtualized devices are devices that um, operate more efficiently than native devices. When a lot of these systems were made, uh, things were very, it was very expensive to use, spend a lot of gates on to do certain operations, and so things were a little bit inefficient compared to what you can do with software today. Para-virtualization tries to um, lower the gap in terms of performance that you might see. Emulated devices, such as disk drives and network devices, have hooks into the native OS so that you can, so that the um, guest can see what looks like disks, what looks like networking interfaces, what looks like serial ports, a whole long laundry list of devices that are just basically too long for me to list here. As I said before, CPU emulation is provided by TCG, which does um, software MMU, as well as a just-in-time compiler as it encounters the code. Another way to view this, if we take a look at uh, maybe layering or system processes, uh, if you were to look at a system that was running a QMU system on it, you might see that a AR64 guest is running on a AMD64 host. There's a number of processes running inside of the QMU guest, but to the host, it looks like one process. And there are a number of processes running on the host, which the guest cannot see. QMU and virtualization. QMU provides a virtualization environment, an environment to manage user uh, guest machines. Uh, and in many ways, it's similar to what Beehive pr provides. It provides a virtualization interface. Um, it runs at near native speed under KVM, Zen, and a couple others, um, and allows migra migration of images from machine to machine. So you can pause a machine and take the image and move it over to another machine um, without the guest OS missing a beat. Uh, 
It requires KVM or Zen support to work. FreeBSD doesn't have KVM support, but it does have Zen support. Some people find this to uh, be a better alternative to Beehive. Others find Beehive easier to use. Uh, if you're looking for more information, I suggest that you look at Roger Monet's how-to, which I've included in my slide. Um, I'm not going to read the URL. You can do that off of the screen. Now, for the bulk of the top, QMU user emulation. Well, first of all, what do we use BSD user for? Um, it's used to build FreeBSD's packages for the embedded platforms. Uh, <clears throat> Up until recently, it was used for ARM64 as well. Uh, the bin format that FreeBSD has, which allows the kernel to take files that match arbitrary patterns and run arbitrary programs when they see those executed, allows for seamless integration. You can run a, if you set this up, you can run a uh, ARMv7, AR64, uh, PowerPC binary on an AMD64 host and not even know that you're doing this potentially. <clears throat> One of the nice things um, about building all the packages, the project uses Pudriere to build all the packages. So Pudriere has all the support to build the uh, guest jails. Uh, it builds a guest jail with say ARM v6 binaries in it that um, execute with the help of QMU user arm static and uh, Pudrio cheats a little bit. It creates a, a number of compilers that are native instruction but produce uh, guest binaries. This allows our builds to run more quickly. Currently we have two BSD user ports. One is uh, QMU BSD user static and that's uh, based on QMU 3.1. It's the last stable version um, the other one is uh, QMU user static devel. It's based on 7.0, the latest version of QMU. Uh, the reason that's not default is there have been a number of regressions uh, over the years. QMU moves very quickly, and it changed uh, some assumptions along the way that broke BSD user in some way that we've not been able to figure out just yet. We found a number of these and fixed them as we find them, but there's still a couple more to find. I'll go into that a little bit more later when I talk about status. Now, this is a typical FreeBSD system, um, or way, a way that you could potentially conceptualize a FreeBSD system. You have a number of processes up here, each one has a number of threads. The kernel will schedule them um, and provide file system and device access for them, and it schedules them amongst the cores that the CPU has. Typically, the CPU will be operating in, uh, with virtual addresses almost entirely. Uh, the kernel um, is probably the only exception to that uh, because it has to uh, do DMA. And to do DMA, you need physical addresses to uh, accomplish that. It also needs to know what the physical to virtual addressing is. The VM system in the kernel needs to know that. Uh, other than that, generally the kernel also uses virtual addresses. Um, and then the memory and other devices have some physical address that is talked to when the device needs to do I.O. or you need to put something in memory. And to understand what the BSD user, uh, user mode emulation is, um, it's easy to say, oh, well, it runs binaries. Well, yeah, but what's, what's the native thing do? What's the FreeBSD kernel do? Well, I'm going to go over how the FreeBSD kernel runs these binaries. First of all, it creates an empty address space. Uh, and maps the binary in. I'm going to say I'm going to use uh, bin ls because it's a simple binary. It's not the simplest in the system, but it has enough interesting things that I can talk about it. Once it loads this binary, it looks at the different parts of the ELF headers to determine what flavor of binary, what brand of binary it is. Is this a, a native FreeBSD binary? Is this um, a Linux binary? Is this something else? Uh, part of doing this, it finds the ldelf.so interpreter to run. Interpreter just is the thing that loads all the other things that it needs. The elf spec provides that this is the first thing that runs. So FreeBSD loads this in immediately after the uh, binary that was loaded in. 
Next, FreeBSD sets up the stack uh, and writes a number of things onto the stack. The FreeBSD kernel communicates to the user land program, not only through the args that were on the command line, but through an auxiliary vector of interesting things about the processor or the process, like this processor is a floating point and has neon support, say, on an ARM machine. Once it's constructed this, it creates the first thread. So it sets up all the CPU state for the thread. Um, it sets up uh, whatever mappings it needs. Uh, and then it jumps to the first thread, which is ldelf.so. ldelf.so starts running. Um, you'll notice that there's a new color here. Everything up to this point has been in blue. And that is the things that the kernel is doing. Things in orange are things that the um, user land is doing. So ldelf so starts up. Um, it parses the auxiliary vector, looks at the uh, command line args, um, looks at the environment, and loads shared libraries that are appropriate for the privilege level um, and environment that it's running in. Now it has to call back to the kernel through a trap. Um, in FreeBSD, all system calls are done via some kind of uh, trap to privileged mode, or trap to the kernel. Um, so LDSO does calls uh, mmap to map in the various libraries. Here it maps in libc, which is probably what everybody was out there guessing before I splashed it up on the screen, but also live t info w and live util. Live t info w is for escape sequences because ls supports color, and live util is for uh, some different utility routines that it uses to report information about the files that are in a common library. Once it has all the libraries loaded, LDL so it's parsing the auxiliary vector and sets it up so that um, the environment that our C runtime uh, expects to run in uh, has available to it, and it calls C, um, uh, the start function. Now, in the ELF binary, the start function is usually what is the entry point. It doesn't have to be that. So this is a, a typical thing with standard libraries and binaries. You could do something different if you wanted to. Um, once start gets going, it uh, puts arg, arg C and arg V and arg, uh, ENVP into a form that the uh, main program expects based on the ABI of the architecture that we're running and calls main. And I could keep going because LS then parses the args and does this and that and what have you. But that's a good point for us to pause in what we're doing. And um, summarize what do we do. The kernel basically sets up the address space, loads the binary, jumps to ldelf.so, uh, and in addition to that, sets up a number of default signals and the, the default system call vector and so forth. ldelf.so uh, loads the shared libraries and jumps to uh, the C runtime library, um, call, and that, which is typically called start. Start calls main, and away we go. Um, I have a new color here, which is green. Um, all of this ran on the same CPU. Now, um, I'm going to put same error quotes because maybe it transferred from core to core in this or package to package. Um, and maybe there were some uh, exceptions and privilege mode uh, transitions, like when system calls were made and the kernel returns from the system calls. Fine. Um, but so far, you know, there have been no signals or atomics or no new threads, nothing like that. This, is a very simplified example that gives you a good flavor of what an emulator would have to do to do the, to uh, get things up and going. And um, this simplified example, though, covers the bulk of what the emulator does, apart from the long list of system calls that it needs to emulate. Um, it, it covers the signals and signal handling it needs to set up, and so forth. Now. There's a number of architectural specific details as well that I've kind of glossed over, maybe given an example or call out to. Um, but the BSD user uh, emulator also has to emulate those. So if you remember the um, system overview, um, it had the CPU emulation uh, talking to um, basically simulated hardware. Here, the CPU talks to um, the SMIP 
the software MMU that handles mapping uh, host addresses to guest addresses. And the just-in-time compiler takes the sequences of instructions and converts them to sequences of data instructions. Uh, in this mode, there's a CPU loop that processes exceptions that the TCG uh, system generates. These are exceptions for traps for system calls, or division by zero, or an illegal instruction, or, you know, there's a whole laundry list that vary from system to system, and the CPU loop has to uh, emulate all that. When it gets a trap of some flavor, it calls um, the guest kernel emulation. And that is the bulk of the uh, specific portion of um, the code that uh, BSD user has, has written. Um, and the guest kernel emulation, um, apart from fixing up signals and so forth, the bulk of what it does and handles is system calls. And for the vast majority of system calls, it just translates a couple of things, maybe widens addresses of the host and guest address uh, are different sizes, and calls the host kernel to do the implementation. So this is a wall of text that explains the same uh, thing, that provides a few more details um, than I was able to go over when I was talking um, in this. The interesting part here is I talked about the kernel emulation code. Well, the interesting thing is that you need to go look at the kernel code to see exactly what it does so you can do exactly the same thing for um, all the system calls and all the auxiliary things that the kernel has to deal with, primarily signals. So here's an example of one of the things that, the, um, that uh, shows the code side by side. On the left, on the left-hand side, on this side over here, is um, the QAMU code. And on the right is the FreeBSD kernel code. And just looking at it, not really knowing a lot about what's going on, you can see that similar structures with similar names uh, are manipulated in similar or the same way. Um, with the only real possible exception here being, you know, what about the FPU? And the FPU is done a little bit differently in user mode than in, in the kernel, so it's not appropriate to do here, even though there's still an XXX comment. And one of the hazards with uh, BSD user, part of the technical debt that I talked about, in, uh, in addition to not keeping up with the QAMU interfaces, is that um, this code has moved from mashdep.c to execmashdep.c. Um, I try to correct those when I see them, but when I was preparing this talk, I thought that would be a good thing to leave in because that's one of the things of um, accumulated technical debt that we have to deal with. So I'm going to briefly run through what QMU does when it ex ex executes LS. So the kernel takes care of running the proper QEMU, so it doesn't have to determine architecture or anything like that. It just does some sanity checks. Um, based on the architecture it's given. It initializes its state, um, the soft MMU address space, the TCG state machine, uh, and um, the kernel's initial state. Um, it then maps the binary um, and takes a note of the mapping so that it can do the guest to host and host to guest mappings that I was talking about earlier. Um, it does this just with the map uh, system call. Uh, it has its own version of the ELF loader that's a little bit simplified from what the kernel does because the number of uh, different variations and weird things it supports are different and it doesn't support multiple system call vectors. It just supports the one vector. So um, it's fairly simplified. Uh, it looks for the interpreter, the ldelf.so, to, to load in. It loads it in uh, potentially from the um, cheroot um, that we're running in. Um, it then does a map anon to create the stack and um, writes these auxiliary ver um, vectors that I talked about with the auxiliary information that's appropriate for the um, guest operating system that's running. And then it pulls all the command lines off the ar uh, ar arguments off the command line that it didn't understand and stuff those um, onto the stack as well. It sets up, uh, just like the kernel, it sets up a default um, 
sort of signal handlers, masks, um, different state that the kernel keeps track of, um, and initializes uh, its state for the guest threads. It's a little bit different than what the kernel does. Um, and then it starts ldelf.so running. Here, everything in blue, uh, if you haven't guessed already, is something that QEMU uh, BSD user does. Um, everything that's in orange is what the guest uh, binary does. So ldelf.so starts running, it loads the shared libraries, um, it makes the system calls for imMap. Um, these cause a trap, which cause the TCG uh, CPU main loop to exit uh, and dispatch this to the emulation code, which does the system call number lookup. It says, oh, this is imMap, these are the arguments, and this is what I need to do, and imMap is special, but I need to do extra special things. Um, but it gets everything loaded in. It loads the same libraries in that were loaded in the, the native execution. Um, and then it parses the vector um, and jumps to the uh, C runtime, which then um, sets up the calls and calls main, and away we go. So it's fairly similar. There's a few differences. Um, the differences become important when you're trying to debug or uh, trace the binary. You'll see different system calls at different times than you would with a native binary. Um, as um, QMU is, is running, <clears throat> and so uh, for QMU, there's not a uh, CPU involved. It's just the, the, the guest CPU running. Um, and you've got the BSD user code, which is the code that, is, or the uh, description that is in blue here. Um, you know, QMU maps everything in and sets up the signal handlers, initializes the MMU, the TCG state, um, it then jumps to ldelf.so, which does its thing and calls start. And um, then as system calls come in and um, exceptional code, division by zero, illegal instructions, what have you come in, um, TCG drops out of its uh, execution and compiling of code uh, to um, you know, tell the uh, emulation code, the kernel, the uh, system code emulator, hey, this interesting thing happened, please handle it. And again, you know, there's a lot of system-specific stuff that I meant, uh, I've omitted to, to give this thing. So here's another way that you could view uh, BSD user. Um, this is a similar to the alternative view that I prevented, presented for uh, QMU um, system code. Here we're, um, here we're running a couple of different guests. I had intended these to be different binary architectures, but it doesn't really matter if they're both ARCH64. We've got Emacs, which is, is running. Uh, maybe the uh, ARM Emacs works better than the native one, maybe not. Um, then LS is running, what have you. Uh, and the QMU process calls the native BSD kernel to implement all the system calls. Um, and again, that's running on an x86 host. So, Upstreaming. One of my primary motivations for doing this talk was to uh, recruit people, to get people interested in this, say, hey, this is a cool project, I want to help out, I want to help out upstreaming. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about the process QMU uses for our, uh, accepting patches, or which is basically the process we need to follow for upstreaming. It uses a modified version of the Linux kernel process, where you um, send patch bombs to a mailing list, they're reviewed, and eventually um, a maintainer picks them up and sends a pull request uh, to um, you know, the, the, the main people in authority of the project, who then, um, if it passes all the tests, brings it into the tree. Same thing with QMU. Um, you send the, the patches, you get the feedback, you send the patches, you get the feedback until there's no more feedback. Um, and then you send um, either, if you're the maintainer, I've sent enough patches that they let me be the maintainer now. Um, so I send the pull request once um, other people have reviewed it. Um, if uh, any of you want to do this, um, I would just incorporate your patches into the next pull request that I would do once they've received sufficient review.
Um, one of the tools um, to do this, if you um, are familiar with email, you know that having a 20 or a 30 or a 40 uh, patch queue that you send out um, is a little bit difficult to manage. So there's something called git publish that I highly recommend if you're doing any of this sort of work at all. It helps to manage the repetitive nature of sending the patches to the mailing list and with the same cover letter that you update for each thing that you update to include the different changes that you made since the last version and so forth. In um, a lot of ways, this augments uh, git send email in much the same way that git arc uh, augments in FreeBSD augments uh, Fabricator and Arc um, and uh, gives tighter integration, makes it easier to, to do this process. So let's say, hey, I want to test. I made some changes, it's time to test it out. Well, in addition to um, pushing this to um, a fork of GitLab, which will run most or at least some of the uh, QMU upstream test, you should make sure that there's no regressions. And there's really two ways um, that uh, we use um, to test. One is Poudrier, where we'll do a Poudrier bulk to build a bunch of packages. Um, usually we hand select the list of packages because there have been problems with them in the past or they're particularly popular. So, um, you know, Python and Go and Rust, although at the moment Go and Rust are broken. I'll get to that in the status. And, um, you know, you build and you see what happens. Usually what happens is either it works and it's relatively quick or it hangs for an hour and the uh, Poudrier hang detection code kicks in and says, oh, this hung, I'm going to fail the build. And usually these days it's hanging because there seems to be some mismatch with multi-threaded programs um, that is making locks not work. I'll get to, again, I'll get to that more in a second. Uh, the other way you can test is you can run QA. FreeBSD has a number of QA tests. There's like 10,000 ballpark uh, tests that you can run. Um, we pass about seven or 8,000 of them right now, um, which is good. Um, and you can run it in one of two ways. Either you can do it before and after testing. You take the code before you make your changes, you run the test, you know what passes, what fails. You do the same thing after you've um, made the test, made the changes that you want to test those and you see if there's any differences. Hopefully there are fewer and you've made improvements, um, but oftentimes, sometimes you have some improvements and some regressions and you have to figure out what's going on. The other way you can do this is if you have access to the native uh, <clears throat> hardware, you can use the native hardware to run the tests and then you can do the BSD user test and see what the difference is in so you can fix bugs and what's going on. Um, unfortunately, a bunch of tests also hang for the same reason I talked about. The good news is, despite all these hangs and uh, gloomy gusts uh, stuff I've been saying about threading, a lot of packages built. Unfortunately, Go and Rust currently are broken. Kyle Evans spent some time a little while ago to fix them up. Uh, and he did fix a number of things that were in the system, but uh, changes in QMU have changed something, and there's some latent bugs that we're looking for. Um, 7.0 is the latest branch in GitHub uh, that I've updated this to. Uh, QMU doesn't have a 7.0 branch. I just updated to a point just after the release and pushed that um, to um, our GitHub repo, which I'll share in a moment. Um, I would love that this to be the only thing that we deal with, and I'd love to stop maintaining the 3.1 based QMU, but there are too many regressions to do that at this time. One, and that also is slowing down upstreaming. With all the regressions, it's hard to know, gee, is this uh, something that was broken before I did this, or is this something that I just broke when I did this refactoring because the upstream folks um, made different suggestions when I submitted my reviews. Um, and like I alluded to on the last side, we're leveraging um, the uh, user test that FreeBSD has to judge the state of uh, BSD user. Now, so while streaming status, these are changes since um, either uh, the code that was in upstream or the 3.1 version um, that um, is our current stable QMU version. 
I've removed MIPS and Spark 64 support. Um, well, you know, that was cool to have and it worked okay. There were a lot of problems and I didn't want to keep updating and maintaining and spending time on these things when the uh, base FreeBSD project had moved on. So I've removed that to lighten the um, maintenance load. Um, Upstream until recently had uh, generic BSD support. You could run any BSD on any other BSD because the system calls are so similar. Well, that might have been true in 1990 or 85 when all the projects fissioned off from each other. That might have even been true in 2000, but it's not true in 2020. So um, now there's FreeBSD, NetBSD, and OpenBSD flavors. Um, I've split them out. Um, you must run FooBSD on FooBSD. There's no more um, running NetBSD binaries on FreeBSD. That never worked. Um, one of the big things that I did with um, Upstream was to pull the pieces from BSD user in that got it to the point where you could uh, run a static binary even. I mean, when, when the Upstream's uh, support had decayed rather badly when I started. Um, I've upstreamed all the ARMv7 code that we have in BSD user, and that's all in. I've started upstreaming some of the system call support and some of the infrastructure around that. Each system call, when it comes in, ha when you make a system call, you have to translate the guest address to the host address, um, which inside of QAMU with TCG, you have to lock and unlock the memory in place so that it doesn't garbage collect it um, when you're not looking, when you have still have um, host addresses pointing into the guest memory. Um, and uh, all of that code uh, seems to be working, but when I went to upstream it, there were a number of review comments for that code. So I've, um, I'm rewriting it now to address the review comments because they were rather extensive. Um, that's something that also I could use some help with. Um, and most of the auxiliary um, bits, the elf loader, the command line parser, um, different bits on um, how do I exist in the BSD world where we want to have a static binary, which isn't supported in upstream anymore. All of that stuff um, has been ironed out. Most of it has been upstreamed, not quite all of it yet. So there's still a few lingering things that could potentially be a useful thing to have other people um, try to get reviewed or to, to work on and test or even just review. Um, here's a rather long list of things that need to be done that are in BSD user now, but aren't in upstream. Um, there's some very, very basic x86, x86 support, um, but it needs signals added and a bunch of TLC, and there's about two, 3,000 lines of code that would need to be upstream um, once it's finished. Um, PowerPC needs to be upstreamed. There is some code upstream right now. Uh, no, actually there's not any code upstream right now. Um, AR64 also needs upstreaming. Um, it seems to work relatively well. We were building packages with it for a long time. Um, and RISC-V uh, needs upstreaming. Um, RISC-V was contributed um, a year or two ago, and it seems to be running fine, but my focus has been on other things, um, trying primarily to get 32-bit um, ARM uh, running end to end with all the system calls. That's been the thing that I want to do because um, when I'm upstreaming system calls and there are bugs present and whatnot, I don't want to keep tweaking each individual architecture um, and getting all of that reviewed. I want to do that uh, in a more streamlined fashion until everything's ready to go. Um, there's the threading bugs that I talked about. It acts as if the locks aren't working. I don't know if this is because we're not locking memory correctly. I don't know if this is a busted atomic. Um, I don't really understand what's happening. Um, all of the places I've gone and looked and put debugging code have turned out to be dry wells, and yet the problem persists. Um, I talked about upstreaming some of the system calls a moment ago, but not all of them have been upstreamed. There's about 12,000 lines of code that need to be reviewed and upstreamed and probably refactored a little bit. Um, one of the things that would be useful is if the uh, command line parsing were harmonized between the BSD user and Linux user. BSD user has a four or a five or a six year old Linux user uh, command line parser that's had a few things pulled in, but is still generally kind of mm, lagging. I'll go with lagging. Um, 
It would also be nice if we could share the ELF loader between the two systems. Um, it would be a little bit less uh, burden. What we have now works uh, and is streamlined for FreeBSD, which is fine, but in the fullness of time, it would be nice because uh, the Linux user folks um, get changes and bug fixes to the um, Linux loader. And it would be nice to have those be the same so that we could benefit from that. And it would also be nice if we could find other ways of sharing common routines with Linux user. One of the things that um, I've done um, with the help of Kyle Evans is to unify the host signaling stuff. In order to do safe system calls on different hosts, you have to do different things that happen to be the same between, uh, FreeBS between BSD and Linux are almost the same. And you know the little bit of assembler that's different is easy enough to uh, partition out into the own, their own places. So the commonization work has started, but it has a ways to go still as well. So let's say you've seen this talk and are really excited about contributing or hanging out or just checking out what's going on. Well, there's a number of ways that you can get involved that you can check this out. Um, there's hash BSD user on FNet that you can join. Uh, different people that are working on a BSD user um, are on this channel. Um, some weeks it's very quiet. Other weeks it's kind of chatty. Um, lately it's been kind of quiet. Uh, likewise, the virtualization channel on FreeBSD's Discord server um, <clears throat> is another place that people hang out. And depending on uh, the mix of people that are doing things, um, we'll talk about it either on IRC or on Discord just for the convenience of, of the contributors because all the uh, help I can get, I gladly accept. Uh, you can email me at imp at freebsd.org or bsdimp.com. Um, you can grab the source from the URL listed here. Um, it's on GitHub uh, today. We accept pull requests. In fact, we try to land everything in the legacy code with pull requests. Uh, the newer stuff is a mix of stuff that I've been doing um, in what's called the Blitz branch um, with uh, pull requests against the Blitz branch. It's kind of been a mixed bag to try to uh, streamline the process so that we can have a faster velocity while upstreaming. If you're really gung-ho, you can join the QMU developers uh, list at the address that you see on your screen um, to review patches that I send in. Uh, but it's a big fire hose. There is a lot of email there. So uh, you need to filter um, just like you would the Linux kernel mailing list. It's not that high volume, but it's substantially more volume than any other mailing list you would get on uh, BSD, primarily from the large number of patches and the discussions about patches that go on there. Alternatively, if you just want to review patches that um, I send in, you have some knowledge in um, this area, you can um, ask me to CC you and I'll CC you on any patches and I'll make sure that others CC you on patches if they neglect to do so. Um, if you've got bug fixes and a pull request you want to send, by all means, send it to the above repo. And if you want to help us get our continuous integration started, um, that would help us uh, judge the pull request, uh, that would be great too. And frankly, anything else that's related to BSD user, uh, user emulation on BSD, on FreeBSD, would be great. Are you with uh, NetBSD or OpenBSD and would like to see the same functionality come there? Great, contact me. I'll tell you the things that you need to do um, to get to the point that's kind of a bare minimum to which we can start adding you to the build and making sure that we don't break you further with things that uh, you know um, the uh, FreeBSD folks are doing. Uh, so uh, before I go, I want to give credit. I've, I've talked as if I've been the only one that has been uh, contributing to the software, and that's absolutely not the case. Stacy Sohn wrote the bulk of this code um, in 2016 to 2018. Uh, Sean Bruno uh, took it over from 2018 to 2020. Um, uh, Michael Orenker and Kyle Evans have contributed along the way at uh, different times. Um, this list is in approximate order. All the rest of these people have, uh, of, of um, sorry, it's in approximate order of the size of the contribution. All the rest of the people on the list have contributed uh, bug fixes. Um, uh, Mark Corbin contributed the RISC-V support. Maybe I should have had his name a little bit higher up on the list. 
And I'm sure there are others that I've missed because my scripts are stupid or they have missed something or um, I've just overlooked you. And if that's the case, my profuse apologies. Uh, I will correct any oversight on the slides that are online. And with that, it's time for questions. Again, my name is Warner Lash. My email address and social media contact information is on the screen. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for listening to my talk and putting up with a little bit of wind noise I was unaware of until I listened to it too and cringed. Um, Stacy Sun asks on IRC, how's the atomic emulation these days? It was a problem child um, when he was working on the code. And um, it's actually pretty good. Um, one of the things that I thought was wrong that was causing the thread hang up that I mentioned in my talk was atomics. And I spent a lot of time trying to break them and talking to the uh, upstream guys uh, in QAMU and uh, all the atomic test cases I wrote worked flawlessly. So it's probably something other than atomics that is going wrong. Um, so it's, uh, it's improved significantly since you were working on the code. So are there other questions today? All right, well, allowing for all the lags in the system, it seems like nobody's written anything last minute. Let me check a couple of the channels. Yeah, nothing has come up. So I guess that's the end of my talk. If you, oh, wait, last minute question. So the question is, I remember back, in the time of the presentation of uh, Sean Bruno at Cambridge, um, one common aspect was the slowness in guest emulation. Um, guest emulation is still slower than native. Uh, it's improved significantly since uh, Sean Bruno's talk, um, but it is still pretty slow. One of the problems um, that um, I think uh, Sean was running into uh, is uh, right now, when you run all the tests, you get a bunch of hangs. And uh, sometimes they hang and sometimes they don't. And if you look closely, you'll see they always hang. Sometimes they hang forever. Sometimes they just hang for um, uh, um, for a couple of seconds. I'm seeing that the hallway is on stream one instead of me. So yeah, I'm going to fix that. Oh, okay. So I guess I'll. Your answers get recorded anyway. Oh, okay. So am I back to talking? I'll just repeat the keep, answer. You can keep talking and it still gets recorded even though oh. it's a stream. Okay. So um, the question was about um, slowness and guest emulation. I'll go ahead and answer on the channel, but I'll answer here as well. Um, emulation is slow. Uh, part of that is because uh, QMU is a little bit slow at emulating guest hosts. Uh, and part of that is due to the bugs that I was talking about with the atomic answer, um, where if you run all the tests that FreeBSD has, you will find that all of the, um, you'll find that some of them hang sometimes. Well, all of them hang. Um, sometimes they just hang for a short period of time, sometimes indefinitely. Um, so the it is gonna be slower than a native build, uh, but the speed in 7.0 is significantly faster than the speed was in 3.1 or in earlier versions when Sean Bruno was talking at Cambridge. Um, again, for people listening along, uh, that was a question on the channel, which is, you know, is guest, uh, guest emulation slow? And unfortunately, it's still slower than native, but faster than it has been. 
Oh, am I hanging again? So are there any other questions that um, people uh, would like to ask while I'm still here? So the symptoms of the walking bug, big, uh, John Baldwin asks, what are the symptoms of the walking bug? The symptoms of the walking bug, basically <clears throat> locks don't work. Um, so, um, and it's hard to know for sure. You try to take out a lock and you don't actually hold the lock or you assume you have the lock and then you fail on, uh, sanity check um, when uh, you go to unlock the lock. The lock is not locked when you think it should be locked. Those are two of the things that are seen um, in terms of programs crashing. And then um, sometimes it just hangs. The locking code thinks it has, um, the locking code thinks that it has uh, to wait for a contested lock and is never woken up and the test times out um, because QA has built-in test limits. So uh, I spent an awful lot of time trying to pin that on atomics and I have not been able to. So um, it's possible that it's atomics. It only happens in multi-threaded uh, instances. Um, it's also possible that there's some we're not locking things into memory. So the atomics are operating on memory that is not stable um, and that QMU is changing out from underneath us. Um, there might be other possibilities as well uh, for that bug. So um, it's uh, got me stumped right now. So those are, those are the symptoms. Does that answer your question, John? Okay, so um, I guess, um, are there any other questions? So the question was about, um, if we're talking atomics, things like PowerPC require reserved instruction and update can't be emulated without special magic. Um, QAMU does emulate them for the most part. Um, that's, uh, a uh, load and store uh, flavor of atomics. Um, I'm not sure exactly what's going on. Our PowerPC support is fairly weak and um, I'm testing on ARM v6 or ARCH64. And QEMU deals with uh, tricky atomic situations by single threading everything. Um, when the atomics are in play. Um, and so for PowerPC, I believe that's how they deal with implementing it. So um, I think at this point, there's no further questions. John and I are chit-chatting on um, IRC about the atomic hang problem. And um, nobody else is answering, asking questions. So maybe we should just and okay. yeah thank you all right thank you everybody bye